Chapter 1 Passenger train travel was not known to be particularly dangerous, especially in Europe, where the machines soared like the wind on rigorously sculpted rails that translated to silky smooth rides. There were many departures a day between Geneva and Milan, operated by several railway companies. One could travel early in the morning or later at night. The trains ran at a maximum speed of 200 kilometers per hour, while their passengers napped, worked, binged shows on streaming platforms, or ate and drank in considerable comfort. This particular ride was a bullet-nosed silver Astoro tilt train operated by Trenitalia. None of the 100-plus passengers was contemplating dying today, except for one. As far as Travis Devine was concerned, this ride was fraught with peril of the kind that would not send you to a hospital, but rather a half dozen feet into the cold earth. The source of the danger had nothing to do with the train. It had been ferreted out by his well-honed situational awareness, which had led him to conclude that his life was in imminent jeopardy. The trip from Geneva to Milan contained beautiful scenery. The soaring, snow-capped Swiss Alps, the lush, verdant valleys, immaculate, aromatic vineyards, two pristine lakes, and the quaint, picturesque villages of Europe ladled in between the two venerable cities. Devine cared nothing about this as he sat in his first-class seat, upholstered in brown leather, staring at seemingly nothing, while actually taking in everything inside the train car. And there was a lot to observe. Devine checked his watch. On some trains, this trip could take five hours and a quarter, but he was on an express ride that would do it in just under four. He had 90 minutes of that trip left, and maybe that same number of ticks to live. Devine would have preferred a packed train car, but his tight escape from Geneva had not allowed for any latitude on the travel time. And this early in the morning, there were only three other passengers in the first class car. The attendants had already been through checking tickets. Despite this being first class, food was not served at the seat, but there was a dining car between the first and second class sections. The attendants were now off somewhere else, as the train had settled into the second half of its journey south. Alpha, Bravo, and Charlie. It was how the former U.S. Army Ranger Devine referred to the three other passengers. Two men, one woman. Not passengers, at least not to him. Adversaries, bogeys, the enemy. The men were sitting together in seats facing each other, forward of Devine's position near the front of the car. The woman was on the other side of the aisle, two up from him. She looked like a student. Textbooks stacked high, a bulky rucksack and a storage rack behind her. She was drawing something in a sketchbook. But Devine had been fooled by people posing as students before. The men wore thick overcoats against the climate just outside the slender train windows, overcoats that could hide a lot. Devine had gotten up and gone to the bathroom twice now, but only once to relieve himself. The other was solely for recon. He had also gotten some food in the dining car and brought it back to his seat. Each time after returning, Devine had glanced at his gear bag, which was behind him on a luggage rack. And the third time, he saw what he thought he would. On his phone, he brought up his train's journey, saw its exact route, its progression, and most critically, its timing. Of particular note was the Simplon Tunnel, which they would enter after passing through the Swiss town of Brig. When they exited the tunnel, they would be in Italy. The article he was now reading said that the tunnel was 12 miles long and would take the train eight minutes to pass through. The tunnel had opened in 1906 and had given its name to perhaps the most famous train in the world, the Simplon Orient Express. Devine wasn't interested in the history. He was focused on the tunnel. He texted a high priority message to an interested party and then checked his watch. He had caught Alpha and Bravo staring at him at different times, but he had made no reaction. These were known in Divine's world as target glances. Charlie, who was wearing a Madrid Real ball cap, had never looked at him, but she had surreptitiously eyed the two men while getting something from her bag. Her movements were mildly tensed, even robotic, he'd observed. She was trying overly hard to appear normal, which was causing her anxiety.
Stress activated the sympathetic nervous system, the flight, fight, or freeze part of the body that present-day humankind could thank its cavemen ancestors for. Fear did things to a body physiologically. The mind could screw with you in ways you could hardly imagine. In trying to save you, its stressor signals could actually kill you with a heart attack or render you incapable of saving yourself. Or in his case, blow a plan to kill someone right out of the water and give the potential victim a chance to survive. Divine analyzed the situation exactly as he had been trained to do, every contingency, every weak point. The men had never removed their overcoats, even though the climate inside was quite comfortable. In fact, Divine had taken his parka off because he had felt warm. Keeping their hands in their pockets, in particular, was an informed tell of malevolent intent, because hands were a necessary accompaniment to a primary weapon, usually a gun. And they had target glanced Divine not once, but twice. Finally, they had never left their seats as far as he could tell. There were no food or drink containers at their tables. That completed the rule of three for Divine. A trio of behavior patterns that was out of the ordinary meant you needed to come up with a plan if you wanted to walk away under your own power. Well, I've got at least four warning signs here because of what I saw in my gear bag, so I need to get my shit together. Divine checked his watch once more and then eyed his bag. After he'd gone to the dining car, he'd come back to find that the zipper was three teeth above where he had left it. And in just the right light, he had seen the whorls of a thumbprint on the pull tab, a thumbprint that was assuredly not his. There was nothing in his bag other than clothes and a toiletry kit. Otherwise, he never would have left it unguarded. He was also kicking himself for not bringing a gun with him on this trip, but that would have been problematic for a number of reasons. At the border station of Domodossola, a contingent of the Swiss Guard boarded to do a customs check. Divine was asked if he had anything to declare and how much cash he had on his person, and he had to show his passport. He watched carefully without seeming to, as they asked the same of the other three passengers. He couldn't see the passports of the two men, but the woman's appeared to be a post-Brexit UK blue and gold, which mimicked the original colors that had been in place on British passports since 1921. Later, he eyed the window as the train began slowing. They pulled into the town of Brigg. No one got on in first class, and no one got off, except for the Swiss Guard contingent. For a moment, Divine thought about exiting the train, too, or telling them of his concerns with the other passengers. However, he had his plan now, and he was sticking to it. And he wasn't trusting anyone right now, not even the Swiss Guard. The opponents he was battling had the resources to buy pretty much anyone and anything. And these foes of his had great incentive to wish Divine harm. Working on behalf of the United States, Divine had helped foil a ballsy attempt by some powerful, if unscrupulous, interests to promote global unrest for pure profit. With the added kicker of overthrowing several governments hostile to the players behind this scheme. It seemed as long as people lusted for wealth and power, this crap would just keep happening. And one day they might just succeed in taking over the world thought Divine. The train glided away from the station. The two attendants came through, and then, seeing no new passengers or anything that needed their attention other than Divine handing one of them the trash from his meal, they left through the opposite end of the train car to do whatever attendants did when their official work was done. The train's speed was posted on a digital screen attached to the bulkhead at the front of the car. Divine watched it rise to 180 kilometers an hour, before it started to drop. He did the mile-to-kilometer calculation in his head to arrive at the length of time the train would be in the Simplon Tunnel. Twelve miles is 19 kilometers. Doing that in eight minutes would mean a constant speed of... Right. He looked at the screen again. 160 kilometers, 153, 142 he put on his parka and rose just as the train entered the tunnel. Now the only real illumination came from the interior car lights. Divine strode up the aisle to the toilet in the connecting vestibule. As he passed the woman, he glanced down at what she was drawing in charcoal. Okay, that makes sense. And It's nice to have at least partial confirmation, but the real proof is about to come and it will be unequivocal. Divine started to combat breathe. 
Inhale for a four count, hold for four, exhale for four, and hold for four. Repeat. This would stop his sympathetic nervous system from kicking on, wiping out his peripheral vision, blowing to shit his fine motor skills, and turning him into a big, dumb animal just waiting to be killed. He would die one day just like everyone else, but it would never happen like that. He passed by Alpha and Bravo, neither of whom looked at him. The automatic doors slid open with a hydraulic sigh, and Divine entered the vestibule. The toilet was off to the right, just out of eye line of the passengers. A few moments later, the toilet door opened, and a few moments later, it closed. The big men rose as though tied together by string and headed after Divine. As they walked, they screwed suppressor cans onto the muzzles of overkill German made machine pistols pulled from their overcoat pockets. They reached the vestibule where they could hear water running and someone talking inside the toilet. They took aim and fired right through the flimsy toilet door. The sounds of the suppressed rounds were covered by the enhanced roar of the train going through the tunnel, which was why they had waited until now to do the deed. They shot in tight patterns, high to low and in between, followed by crisscrossed streams. They were fields of fire that left no room for survival in the confined space, with 60 rounds total, death of the target was guaranteed. While Bravo covered him, Alpha nudged open the wrecked door, just to make sure, since their kill contract required it, along with an iPhone pic of the corpse texted to their employer. However, all he saw was an empty toilet with the water tap wedged on, and a phone on the floor and leaning against the wall next to the toilet. A podcast was playing on the device. At that moment, the door to the storage closet opposite the toilet swung open and caught Bravo at the right temple. Having let them empty out their weapons, Divine was now the predator. Where each man stood, Divine's goal was to claim that ground, and the only way to do that was to go through them. Divine opened his campaign with twin thumb eye gouges that blinded Bravo. Divine next formed a V with his hand, the thumb on one side and the four fingers on the other, and slammed the hard groove of the flesh between them against the man's throat, collapsing his trachea. This was followed by twin crushing elbow strikes to the right side of the cervical spine that snapped two of the man's vertebrae, cutting off his brain from the rest of his body. He dropped to the floor out of the fight and also out of life. This continuous fluid movement had taken all of four seconds. Divine next trapped a stunned Alpha and his machine pistol against the door jam of the toilet as the man tried to slap in a fresh mag, Divine made the gun fall from his hand by wrenching it downward and then to the side past the joint's limits with cartilage cracking torque. Alpha should have already reloaded and attempted to shoot Divine, but the man's breathing was ragged as his adrenal glands flooded his bloodstream with cortisol, fouling his mind body connection. His pupils went from two millimeters to nine in less than a breath. His peripheral vision was completely blown. Divine already knew he was going to win this fight, because none of that was happening to him. His cognitive and hence his fighting skills were operating fine. Alpha awkwardly swung at Divine and caught him a glancing blow on the jaw. It was not hard enough to do any real damage, and the panicked man had forced himself off balance with the move. Two punishing elbow slams to the exposed right kidney dropped Alpha to his knees. Divine grabbed him by the collar and flung him headfirst against the train wall once and then again. The desperate man, perhaps sensing his own imminent death, pulled a knife and spun around, and the blade slashed against Divine's arm. But his aim was shaky and thus off, and Divine's thick parka took most of the damage. Okay, time to end this and him. Divine broke the man's grip on the knife and it clattered to the floor. He then slapped the man's right ear with such force the eardrum burst. The man seized up, presenting his face directly to Divine, who used a palm strike on his nose, hitting him once and then again with the cup of his hand, releasing all the kinetic energy from his brawny arm, shoulder, broad back, and thrust hip. This streamlined attack delivered massive torque that propelled the nose's brittly sharp cartilage straight into Alpha's soft brain tissue. He dropped to the floor face first. Just to be certain, Divine reached down and broke the man's neck in the exact way the U.S. Army had taught him. Divine dragged both dead men and their weapons into the toilet, turned off the water, retrieved his phone, and wedged the shot-riddled door shut. 
Fighting wasn't just knowing certain techniques, although that was important. It was mostly an evolved state of mind. Without that, enhanced hand-to-hand -hand combat skills meant squat, because you would be too cowed to employ them. And the very concept of self-defense was a losing proposition, pretty much conceding the field and making you a victim in waiting. You didn't defend. You attacked. You didn't stop someone from hurting or killing you. You hurt or you killed. Them. Rubbing his bruised jaw and gingerly touching his cut arm, which he instinctively knew wasn't that serious, he re-entered the train car to see Charlie staring at him. What happened? She exclaimed, her eyes agog. What was that noise? All right, thought Divine. This is where the rubber meets the road. As he walked toward her, Divine glanced for a moment in the train window, which reflected the interior because they were still in the Simplon Tunnel for at least another few minutes. He saw what he needed to see. He shrugged. Two guys, real mess in the toilet. Going to be quite a cleanup. My goodness, is there anything I can do? Her neck muscles were now relaxed, he noted. Pupils normal, breathing the same. She was a cut above the deceased goons back there. Divine stopped next to her, looked down at the drawing and said, Yeah, you could explain why you've been sitting here for over two hours working away and you haven't added a damn thing to your sketch. She half rose and swung the long bladed knife up from her lap, but Divine had already seen the weapon in the window reflection. He didn't waste any time on a defensive block. He simply clocked her in the jaw, lifting her far smaller body off the floor and knocking her against the wall. She slumped down into unconsciousness from the force of his blow and her collision with the wall. Divine momentarily pondered whether to finish the job, but she was young and might repent from her evil ways. He took the knife, slid her ball cap down, draped her hair around her slender shoulders, and propped her up against her seat as though she were merely napping. He grabbed his gear bag and walked into the dining car, and then through the second-class carriages until he reached the last car, where he slipped her knife into a trash receptacle. The train cleared the tunnel, and when it slowed and stopped at Streza, the last station before Milan, Divine got off. The text he had sent earlier paid dividends when the black sedan picked him up. The driver would take Divine the rest of the way to Milan. There, he would catch a flight back to the United States, where another mission surely awaited. As he glanced back at the train, Divine wondered whether he had made a mistake in allowing the woman to live. The answer wouldn't be long in coming. Chapter 2 Sitting in a tacky office in a 1960s-era strip mall in Annandale, Virginia, Emerson Campbell was not a happy man. He was a retired Army two-star and, like Travis Devine, Ranger tabbed and scrolled, meaning he had graduated from Ranger School and then been accepted into the elite 75th Ranger Regiment, the Army's most prestigious and demanding special ops force. His gunmetal gray, closely scalped hair and weathered grim features spoke of a lifetime of discipline and heightened professionalism. And perhaps most tellingly, all the shit he had seen fighting on behalf of his country through a number of wars and also under-the-radar operations the public would never know about. Devine sat on the other side of the desk and took in the man who, several months before, had recruited him to serve in the Office of Special Projects, under the massive bureaucratic dome of Homeland Security. Special projects, thought Divine. It sounds like we plan office parties and cotillions. It's a shit show, Divine. The Italian and Swiss governments have filed official complaints. Two dead guys in a shot-up train toilet between their countries. Not a good optic. It's a better optic than one dead guy, meaning me. IDs on the corpses? Campbell shrugged. Kazakhstan muscle, no more, no less. They've killed at least 20 people. All wired funds upon proof of the kill, no traceable interaction with whoever hired them. No way to dig beyond that, which is the whole point. Glad I denied them the 21st. And the woman? There was no woman found there, said Campbell. She must have recovered and hightailed it out of there. CCTV? Working on it. 
Though the Italians and Swiss are not exactly too cooperative right now. Devine shook his head. Knew I should have taken her out, but she was unconscious and no threat to me. He caught Campbell studying him. I know it was a hard call, Devine. Don't know what I would have done. Well, I gave you a description. Maybe your people can run her down. Now let's focus on your new mission. I don't get a couple days off, said Devine, only half-jokingly. You can rest when you're dead. Yeah, that's what they told me in the army, too. Campbell said, I emailed you the briefing doc. Pull it up. Devine opened the attachment to the email on his phone and gazed at the photo of a lovely woman in her late 30s with smooth, pale skin, blonde hair, and deep-set, intelligent eyes that seemed to shimmer with unsettling intensity in the midst of all the fine pixels. Campbell said, That's Jennifer Silkwell. You heard of the Silkwells? No, but I'm sure I'll learn everything about them before this is over. Curtis Silkwell was the senior U.S. senator from Maine. His great-great-grandfather made several fortunes, shipping, fishing, real estate, agriculture. All of that wealth is now mostly gone. They have the old homestead in Maine, but that's about it. He was a senator. He resigned during his third term. Alzheimer's, which has gotten progressively worse. He was treated at Walter Reed before it became clear there was nothing that could be done. He's currently at a private facility in Virginia awaiting the end. He was treated at Walter Reed because he was a senator? No, because he was a soldier. He retired from the Marines as a one-star before jumping into politics, getting married, and having a family. Campbell shot Devine a scrutinizing glance. Full disclosure, Kurt is one of my best friends. We fought together in Vietnam. He saved my life twice. Okay. So this is personal for me, Devine. Yes, sir. His wife, Claire, divorced him right after he won his last re-election. Between you and me, I think she could see what was coming and decided to bail. So much for in sickness and in health. Where is she now? Already remarried to some rich guy in D.C. who isn't worthy of polishing Kurt's combat boots. So the case, prompted Devine, wanting to push Campbell off the personal edge and back onto the mission-driven one. Go to page five of your briefing. Jennifer is the eldest daughter of Curtis and Claire. She worked for CIA, mostly in field operations, though she once served as a liaison to the White House for Central Intelligence. She was a quick climber and incredibly talented, and she will be sorely missed. Devine scanned page five. What happened to her? Someone killed her four days ago up in Maine, where she was visiting her old hometown. The man's voice cracked before he finished speaking. Devine lifted his gaze. Campbell's face was flushed, and his bottom lip was trembling. I held her in my arms when she was a baby. I was her damn godfather. He wicked tears away, and, composed, he continued. Kurt got started late on his family. He was nearly 40 when Jenny was born. Claire was a lot younger. She was still in college when they got married. They have any leads on who might have killed her? None that we know of. And our interest? Jenny Silkwell was a valuable asset of this country. She was privy to many of our most precious national secrets. We need to know if her death was connected to that, and whether anyone was able to gain any information that would jeopardize our interests. Her personal laptop has been found at her home, and her government-issued phone was there as well. But her CIA laptop was not found at her office or her home, and neither was her personal phone. The geolocators on the devices have been switched off. That's normally the case for people like Jenny, unless she's in an operational area where orders or logistics require she keep them on. The data is mostly cloud-based now, but she might have something on her hard drive or on her phone that is sensitive and we don't want anyone using her devices to backdoor into our clouds. So I'm heading to where she was killed in Maine. Yes, Putnam, Maine, but not yet. I want you to talk to Claire first in D.C. She may know something helpful. Then you head to Maine. The details of Jenny's death are contained in your briefing book, pages 8 through 10. Devine read quickly but comprehensively, just as the Army had trained him, 
In combat, time was not on your side, but neither was skipping over something in a briefing that might prove catastrophic later. The shooter didn't police their brass? Right, and technically the casing was polymer, not brass. Divine looked surprised because he was. A polymer casing? Yes, it expands and then contracts in the chamber immediately. Brass just expands, as you well know. Less degradation on the equipment because the polymer insulates the heat from the chamber. And less heat and friction reduces choke rate, said Divine, referring to the hesitation of the weapon in firing due to those factors. The Army's been slowly moving away from brass. Hell, they've been wedded to it since before the Spanish-American War, so it's about damn time. And the Marines are testing polymer casings for their 50 cal M2 machine gun, and the Brits are looking at polymer too, for their 556 millimeter rounds. A good thing, too. Brass adds a lot of weight to your gear pack. That's why they're making the switch. What well, with smartphones and handheld computers and more weaponry and optics, the Army carry load is up to about 100 pounds now for each soldier. Switching from brass to polymer is a cost-effective way of lightening the load. For the Marines, a 48-box pallet of the 50 cal in polymer weighs nearly 700 pounds less than brass. And there's even the possibility of 3D printing repair parts in the field because the casings are recyclable. As he'd been speaking, Divine had continued to read. He looked up. It was a 300 Norma Mag round. Yes, replied Campbell. And the head stamp shows it's a U.S. military round. Army snipers and special ops guys chamber the Norma in the Barrett MK-22 rifle. Divine nodded. They switched from the 6.5 Creedmoor round after I mustered out. But does the Army already use polymer casings for the 300 Norma? No, Divine. There are tests being run at various Army facilities across the country, chambering the Norma and other ordnance with a polymer casing. But it has not been officially deployed. You know how that goes. Army needs to shoot a shit ton of it under every conceivable combat environment before it has any chance of getting approved for mass deployment. Who's the manufacturer? Warwick Arsenal, a small firm out of Georgia. So the question becomes, how did a still-in-testing 300 Norma polymer round produced by a firm in Georgia end up at a crime scene in Maine? Campbell said, We've spoken with the people at Warwick. They have checked and rechecked their inventory and found nothing amiss. But to me, that's meaningless, because they've shipped hundreds of thousands of these rounds to Army facilities throughout the country, with hundreds of personnel taking part in the testing. There is no way that every single round can be accounted for. Proverbial needle in a haystack. So someone could have pocketed the polymer casing and given it to someone, and then it goes through various hands and ends up being used to kill Jenny Silkwell. Was it important she was shot with that particular bullet? Did she have any involvement with its development? None. And I have no idea if the use of that particular bullet is significant or not. That's your job to find out during your investigation. By the way, the local cops are also working the case. You'll have to team with them. And why would they team with me? Campbell took from his desk drawer what looked like a black leather wallet and slid it across. Here's why. Divine opened what turned out to be a cred pack, complete with shiny badge, and examined it. He looked up in surprise. I'm a special investigator with Homeland Security? Seriously? Your cover is rock solid. Only I'm not a trained investigator. Campbell gave Divine a drill sergeant death stare. Don't sell yourself short. You carried on investigations in the Middle East in addition to your combat duties, and you did a pretty damn good job of sleuthing back in New York on the Bragg Cowell case. And you've done stellar work with the other assignments I've given you. Now you are to find out who killed Jenny and why, and determine if any of our national security interests have been compromised, and find her laptop and phone. Well, that sounds simple enough, said Divine dryly. Rise to the challenge, soldier, retorted Campbell. Why don't the feds have a joint op platoon of agents on this? Central intelligence goes scorched earth when one of its own goes down, and the FBI too. CIA has no jurisdiction on American soil. And if we deploy an army of FBI, the press will start to pry and word will get out. Then our enemies could see us as weakened and themselves emboldened. 
Jenny Silkwell might very well have been killed because of something having absolutely nothing to do with her status with CIA. If so, we want to go in stealth and stay that way if the facts on the ground allow. So right now, you, Divine, are the army. And if my rock-solid cover gets blown, we never heard of you. Chapter 3 a light drizzle was falling as Divine pulled through the open gates of Claire Robards' mansion in Calorama in northwest D.C. It was one of the most expensive areas in the capital city, with the median price of a home well north of seven figures. Calorama, Divine had learned, was Greek for beautiful view, and it was beautiful, if one had the hefty entrance fee. Embassy Row was on nearby Massachusetts Avenue, and the Dutch and French ambassadors' official residences were in the vicinity, along with 30 foreign embassies. Jeff Bezos also had a home nearby that he had laid out $23 million for, and then bought the place next door for another $5 mil. Billionaires apparently needed a lot of room, or else a healthy buffer from the merely rich, Divine thought. At that level, it's just monopoly money anyway. The Robards' mansion was substantial, made of stone and large rustic timbers with small windows and cone-topped metal turrets. The property had wide, sloping lawns and mature trees and plantings. No money spared and no detail overlooked to create a display of subdued old money wealth that judiciously managed not to overwhelm with inflated grandiosity. He had phoned ahead, so the well-dressed, professional-looking woman who answered the door led Divine directly down a long, marble-floored hall, to a set of imposing solid oak doors. She knocked, and a woman's cultured voice from inside the room said authoritatively, Come in. And so Divine stepped into, perhaps, the lioness's den. Claire Robards was perched regally on a settee in a room that was lined with shelves which were, in turn, filled with leather-bound books. Against one wall, a small bar was set up, was it his imagination or did Robards' gaze slide toward it? The lady's light green dress was exquisitely tailored to her thin, petite frame. She had allowed her shoulder-length hair to turn an elegant white. She fiddled with a strand of small, lustrous pearls and looked everywhere except at Divine. The woman was clearly uncomfortable with his presence here. She wore little makeup and the dark circles under her reddened eyes spoke of long bouts of crying. Maybe she thinks if she ignores me, her eldest daughter wouldn't be dead. Ms. Robards, I'm Travis Devine with Homeland Security. Yes, I know, Mr. Devine, she said in a low voice. Please sit. She finally looked at him, resignedly, Devine concluded. Would you like something hot to drink? It's quite chilly today. No, thank you, I'm fine. He settled into a wing chair opposite her and I'm very sorry for your loss. She twitched at his words and closed her eyes for a moment. We all thought Jenny was indomitable, a survivor. She had survived much until this ugly, ugly business. She had a stellar career and a brilliant future in serving her country. That goddamned job cost my daughter her life, she barked. Then she quickly let the regal mask slide back down over her features. I'm sorry, she said in a hushed voice. No reason to be. He glanced around. Is your husband here? Vernon is in Thailand, at least I think so. Business, she added with a touch of bitterness. Apparently for some people, business and making money trumps all, even the murder of one's stepdaughter. She glanced at her lap and let her fingers intertwine, as though she suddenly felt the need to hold on to herself. It's funny, Mr. Devine. What is? When I married Kurt, he was already a war hero, this big, strong Marine that no enemy could defeat. And he was gone all the time, too, not to make money, but to serve his country like Jenny did. He survived that, and then he got into politics, worked his way up and eventually ran for the Senate and won. And he was gone all the time again, not for the money, but to serve. And here's the funny thing. She paused and seemed to collect herself, running her fingers delicately along her expensive pearls. 
The funny thing is, for the people left behind, the motivation doesn't matter. The result is the same. One is alone. I can see that. She looked around at the tastefully decorated room in the luxurious mansion in the pricey sought after neighborhood with beautiful views. And in case you're wondering, as so many have, no, the grass is not always greener. I understand that Jenny was not in full agreement with the divorce, he said quietly. She hated me for it, plain and simple. Robards dropped her hand to her lap. She and apparently everyone else thought I left Kurt because of his illness. The fact was we had agreed to divorce a year before. But these things take time, and he had an election coming up, so we made the mutual decision to wait. He won the race, and we went our separate ways. Then he was diagnosed shortly thereafter, and I became the thoughtless ex-wife. I suppose you could have halted the divorce proceedings, noted Divine. I'd already met Vernon and was engaged to him. We were waiting for the final decree to announce our impending wedding, and the truth was I had given Kurt four decades of my life and three children. He had his twin careers. And me? I hadn't even started to live my life yet. So I decided to move forward and do just that before it was too late. Kurt was going to receive the best care regardless. She glanced up. I suppose you think me heartless too. While it may be tempting for many, judging others has never been a fascination of mine. She nodded. Now how can I help you? When was the last time you saw or spoke to your daughter? I saw her at an event at the Senate to honor Kurt's legacy about six months ago. Was that also the last time you spoke to her? Her gaze fell to her lap. No, she actually called me recently. She said she was heading to Putnam. She grew up there, along with our other two children. An ancestor of Kurt's, Hiram Silkwell, built the family home there. It's quite gothic and I think extraordinarily ugly. Kurt kept paying the taxes on it until he became ill. He couldn't part with it, apparently. He was always a very nostalgic person, very much tied to the past in certain respects. Did she say why she was going there? She said she had some unfinished business. What sort of business? Asked Divine sharply. She didn't say and I didn't ask. Divine looked skeptically at her. She caught this look and explained. Our relationship had changed, Agent Divine. She was a grown woman who no longer needed or wanted my advice or counseling. But she called you, even though you two were estranged. Must have been a reason. If there was, it eluded me. Okay, any guess as to what she was referring to about the unfinished business? None. And your other children? Dak and Alex, they still live in the family home. Any idea why they want to live in an ugly old gothic house? They apparently like it there. I lived there with the kids while Kurt was in Congress. Neither one of us wanted the children to be here in the limelight. What do they do? Alex is the youngest and an artist, and an incredibly talented one who could make a fine living if she would ever get an agent. I've been told by old friends up there that she also teaches art in the public school on a part-time basis. She paused and smiled, but it was accompanied by a sad, bittersweet expression. She said, Jenny was the golden child, brilliant, enormously driven, lovely, she had it all. But Alex was no slouch, either. She was more beautiful than Jenny and smart, too. Because of her late birthday, she was always the youngest in her class. Then, because of her ability, she skipped an entire grade in elementary school. Not even Jenny managed to do that, she added. And your son? Dak has a tattoo parlor and some other business interests up there. He's very entrepreneurial. I think he wants to make a zillion dollars to show he doesn't need any of us. He was in the army but got discharged. Can I ask why? Dak can tell you if he wants. Could Jenny have been going to see them? It's possible. I've tried to call both of them, but they haven't gotten back to me. Were your kids close with one another? They used to be. But life changes people, you know. Yes, ma'am. 
But I guess Dak and Alex get along if they live together. It's a big house, she said simply. Big enough to feel like one is living alone. Where and when will the funeral take place? There won't be one. In her will, Jenny stipulated that she wanted to be cremated and her ashes scattered over the ocean. No ceremony, no fuss. I guess she was the sort to plan ahead. I just wish she had managed to stay alive until long after I was dead and buried. Well, she had no choice in the matter, he pointed out. Sniffling, Claire said, Kurt doesn't even know she's gone. Divine noted, maybe that's for the best. When was the last time you saw Alex or Dak? It's been several years, actually. I suppose that qualifies as estranged, she added, closing her eyes, her features laden with misery. Ever since your divorce. I suppose the two are intertwined, she said dully, opening her eyes and gazing off. He rose. Well, thank you for seeing me. If you think of anything else, please contact me. He handed her his card on which the fresh ink seemed to glow. She reached across, took the card, and then gripped his hand with surprising strength. Please find out who took her away from me, Mr. Devine. Please. He looked down at her. I'll do my best, ma'am. I can promise you that. Chapter Four the next morning, Devine walked into a private care facility in Northern Virginia with Emerson Campbell to visit Curtis Silkwell. Claire still visits him every week here, said Campbell as he held the door for Devine. Not so heartless then, replied Devine, drawing a tortured scowl from the other man. Heartless enough, Campbell shot back. A nurse led them to a room in a secure memory care unit. The space was small and sparsely furnished and held, at least for Divine, a sense of marching in slow motion, a wait for the inevitability of death. After the nurse left them, both men turned their attention to the frail figure in the bed. There were no tubes hooked up to him, though there was a machine monitoring his vitals. He's comfortable, in no pain, so they tell me. They're going to have to put a feeding tube in soon, said Campbell grimly. His voice carried a level of distress Divine had never heard before. He's not eating, he doesn't think to when he's awake, just stares at the offered food and then goes back to sleep. And when they do get some food in him, things get clogged and he has to be aspirated. He has a DNR in place and pretty soon they will wind things down. They looked down at the shrunken, sleeping patient. I remember a 6'2", 220-pound wall of a man, added a hollow-voiced Campbell leading his men into one hell after another and coming out victorious on the other side. Won every medal and commendation the Marines offered. He should have had a shoulder full of stars, but he refused to play the necessary games. Same as you, noted Divine. He was more deserving, replied Campbell. To my mind, every person who puts on the uniform and picks up a weapon in defense of their country is deserving. Silkwell stirred under the sheet and his eyes opened. He looked at neither of them, his unfocused gaze playing across the ceiling for a few moments before the eyes closed once more. He stopped recognizing me months ago, said Campbell. The doctors say the progression is accelerating. No chance of recovery. Fucking disease. Campbell led Divine out and quietly closed the door behind them before facing off with the younger man. I brought you here, Divine, because I wanted you to see a true American hero, and he deserves to have his daughter's murderer brought to justice. You have no confidence in the police up there? Since it's a two-person department with few resources, no, my confidence level is not high. And if Jenny's death is connected to her work at CIA, it comes under the Fed's umbrella, not the locals. But you have to snoop around first and find out something we can hang our jurisdictional hat on. So I'm to find the killer and ascertain if any secrets have been stolen. If you find the killer, we have lots of experts who can help us determine the secrets issue, or whether her death was retribution for something having to do with national security. The sister and brother who live up there in the old homestead, I suppose they're suspects? I told you Claire informed me Jenny was going up there to finish some old business. Yes, family, friends, strangers, foreigners. 
everyone is a suspect right now. And what if the killer is long gone by now? We'll attack that bridge if we come to it. Outside the facility, Campbell shook the younger man's hand. I have no higher priority right now. Good luck. Many things tell me you're going to need it. Campbell was driven off in a government SUV. Devine stood in the parking lot for a few moments, glancing back at the building where a doomed man didn't even know his eldest daughter had not survived him. He knew this was personal to Campbell. And while Devine had to maintain a professional objectivity, he knew a certain element of this mission was now personal to him as well. In his book, A Dying Warrior Deserved No Less. Chapter 5 After a short pinballing flight in high winds, the plane thudded onto the tarmac in Banger, Maine. After deplaning, Devine grabbed his rental Tahoe and commenced the two and a half hour drive east to Putnam. The tiny hamlet was located on the rocky Atlantic coast and had fewer souls than the passengers on the United Airlines jumbo jet flight Devine had taken back from Italy. The leaves had long since turned color and abandoned their respective trees and bushes. Devine's memories of a scorching summer in New York City and a mild fall in Europe had all been extinguished by the bitter cold here. His cable-knit sweater was underwhelming in its warmth factor. He reached Machias, turned onto Route 1, and kept going north for a while until he turned off onto another road that took him east toward the world's second biggest ocean. He could already smell the briny air and feel the bite of the punishing wind that kept rocking the Tahoe. He looked at a long inlet the ocean had cut into the rocky shore, and despite the mission he was on, the serene view lent Divine some calm. Before the storm. Divine glanced at his gear pack. Inside, among other things, was his Glock 9mm, a backup pistol, and extra ammo for both. As Divine drove, he went over in his mind the briefing details. Jenny Silkwell had been an operations officer at CIA. Her focus for the past few years had been on the Middle East. Before that, her area of involvement was the Russian Federation, and before that, South America. A gifted natural linguist, she spoke fluent Spanish, Portuguese, Russian, and Polish, and through immersion classes she had learned Arabic and Farsi before moving on to the Middle East region. Her job had led her to travel all over the world to meet with the human intel on the ground that she had recruited to work with America. And maybe that had placed a wicked bullseye on the back of Jenny Silkwell because the Russians, as well as factions in the Middle East, were not shy about striking back against perceived enemies. The answer to her murder might well lie in Moscow, Tehran, or Damascus rather than Putnam, Maine. He had read both the national and local accounts of the murder. The national news had sent crews up here and broadcast stories for a few days until they moved on to newer stories that would capture more eyeballs. He supposed if the killer were tracked down and arrested, the big guns would be back up here to report on it. In contrast, the local news, such that it was, had continued to go full bore with the story. Devine could imagine that the unsolved murder of a CIA officer and daughter of a war hero and former U.S. senator, who was himself a scion of a prominent and formerly wealthy Maine family, would be the most newsworthy thing that had ever happened in Putnam. Along the way, he had passed signs that said he was on the Bold Coast Scenic Byway, and it fit the bill. As his journey brought him closer to the Gulf of Maine shoreline, Divine, at intervals, saw narrow strips of sandy and pebble beaches, as well as towering granite bluffs standing sentry along craggy coves filled with rock-strewn headlands and stout, robust greenery holding purchase on the saltwater-slicked rock wherever it could. There were also vast forests that reached to the horizon, and old orchards of fruitless trees leading right up to rocky cliffs standing firmly next to the water, like silent sentries. Finally, a weathered board on a rotting post announced the legal boundary of Putnam and stated its official population to be a few shy of 250. They must be hardy souls, thought Devine. The rugged topography and raw weather did not look like it was designed for the faint-hearted. He passed a young man in a New England Patriots ski cap riding a rusted bicycle that had no seat. 
That was followed by two young women astride mud-splattered ATVs puttering along. A battered 1980s-era station wagon slowly passed him going the other way. The driver had heavily wrinkled features and the hanging jowls of a Great Dane, and a head topped by fine snowy hair. He gave Divine a grim face once over before he headed on down the road. The Putnam Inn was located on the town's narrow main street, the asphalt barely two cars wide. Divine angled into a parking space and tugged out his bags. He looked across the street to where a small harbor nearly encircled by chiseled granite bluffs was situated, with a slender outlet to the Gulf of Maine's slice of the ocean. There was also what looked to be a man-made breakwater to give added protection from storms. A number of boats were docked in slips weathered by the unforgiving elements, while others were moored out on the smooth, glassy water of the harbor. Men in heavy work clothing and calf-high waterproof boots were laboring on the docks and also on the boats, tying up ropes, lifting heavy boxes and metal cages, and scrubbing the grime and barnacles off raised hulls. It was a bustle of activity that was probably replicated up and down the coast here. The smiling woman behind the front desk told Divine she was Patricia Kingman, the inn's owner. Welcome to Putnam. I'll apologize in advance if our service is not up to snuff. We're understaffed. That's why I'm manning the front desk. Nobody wants to work anymore. They blame it on COVID. I say it's just being lazy. The X, Y, and Z generations, or whatever they call themselves, no work ethic. Divine, who was a member in good standing of the Millennials, stayed silent as he signed in and produced his driver's license and credit card. He received his room key, one of the old-fashioned kind with a one-pound slug of lead attached. You can leave that weapon here when you go out, she quipped, eyeing the key with amusement. Unless you want to do arm curls. I think I'll keep it with me, thanks, replied Divine, who would never leave such an open and easy invitation into his private space lying around. Kingman's amused expression vanished as she first looked startled and then suspicious. What are you in town for, Mr. Divine? Can't be a pleasure unless you like the inside of a freezer. A little business. He eyed her steadily. I understand you had some trouble recently. I guess you can call the murder of a poor young woman trouble, yes. What was her name again? Jenny Silkwell. Wait, wasn't there a senator by that name from up here? Curtis Silkwell, Jenny was his daughter. He got sick and had to resign. I knew Jenny since she was in pigtails and knee socks, smart as a whip, pretty and nice as can be. She worked in Washington, D.C. She glanced carefully around as though there might be someone listening. Some folks say she was a spy or some such for us. Do these folks believe she was killed because of that? A stony expression slid down over the woman's features. Well, I can't see anyone from around here hurting one hair on Jenny's head. Everyone loved her. Well, at least one person didn't, thought Divine. So she grew up here. She nodded. At the Silkwell's ancestral home, Jocelyn Point, named after Hiram Silkwell's wife. He made money hand over fist well over a century ago and built that place. Any Silkwells left here? Alex, Jenny's younger sister, and her brother Dak, they live at Jocelyn Point. I suppose Jenny came up to visit with them when she was killed? Kingman folded her arms over her chest and took a symbolic step back. My, my, I can't imagine why I've been gabbing so much about the Silkwells to a complete stranger. You have a nice visit here, Mr. Divine, and just so you know, outsiders aren't usually welcome here. But I would imagine your entire business model depends on the exact opposite of that sentiment. She twisted her mouth in displeasure. Your place is right behind here, first cottage on the right. She walked through a blue curtain set behind the front counter. Divine grabbed his bags and off he went, a stranger in a place that didn't particularly care for them. Story of my life. Chapter 6 the cottage was comfortably furnished, with a big four-poster bed being its chief feature, with a duvet and matching canopy done in seascapes and lobsters, a blackened-faced wood-burning fireplace with a small stack of cedar logs and kindling set next to it in a wrought-iron holder took up much of another wall. 
He put his things away and laid out several telltale traps in case anyone breached his room while he was away. He then sat at a small desk set up by the window and looked over the briefing book on his phone. Jenny Silkwell could have certainly made enemies in her line of work. But if a foreign government wasn't behind her death, who else would have the motive? Well, that's what you're here to find out. So let's get to it. He slipped his Glock into a belt holster, locked his door, deposited the one pound lead slug key in his pocket, climbed into his Tahoe, and set off. He drove slowly past the harbor and marveled at the beauty of nature's rock carvings. He saw a few boats puttering back in, the men on them looking bleary-eyed and exhausted and smoking cigarettes and gulping bottled water, even in the cold. Tough way to make a buck. Hope they scored big on whatever they were going out for. He drove to Jocelyn Point along the winding coast road. As dusk set in, the equal parts grim and picturesque landscape assumed patches of pulsing darkness, shouldered with sections still lit by the fading sun. Divine pulled out his military-grade optics and took a look. Set far off the road on an otherwise deserted stretch of land, the home's backdrop was the black, rock-strewn, craggy coastline that the Atlantic pummeled unceasingly. Divine had seen pictures of the home, but it hadn't done the place justice. The building itself looked like every haunted house you had seen in movies or on TV. Grim, stark, joyless, it stood like a defiant remembrance of a far more somber and unforgiving era. Constructed of rough-hewn timbers and rugged, dark stone that was probably locally quarried, Jocelyn Point possessed the tall, looming face of a hunk of marble statuary with a wooden-railed widow's walk at its zenith. Multiple turrets, both cone and square-shaped, all topped by slate roofs fouled by the elements, stuck out here and there from the home's facade like wayward strands of hair. The exterior was covered with nature's makeup, chunks of moss and patches of lichen, which evidently flourished in the damp, briny air. He saw other buildings dotting the large property. Some looked abandoned, others were falling down, but still others looked reasonably habitable. Maybe these were old servants' quarters, he thought, for when people actually had them on properties like this. The grounds had been allowed to mostly go to ruin, the hefty wrought iron gates that had once been attached to stout stone pedestals emblazoned with the letter J on one and the letter P on the other were both hanging on to life by a single rusted hinge each. The place had innumerable windows, all small, gleaming, and mullioned like the eyes of a spider, with little ability to capture much sunlight but only to reflect it back. The large wooden door that was the main entrance to the place was battered and sullied by weather. Straggly, leafless trees stood next to the house, their bare limbs caressing the crudded walls with every passing breeze. Divine lowered his optics as the sun fell rapidly into the pocket of the western sky. Darkening clouds scudded overhead as the northeasterly breeze stiffened. As he continued to watch, a light came on in a second-floor window. Divine once more lifted his optics to his eyes. The range and clarity on this piece of surveillance equipment was impressive. For what it had cost the government, he knew it should be. Twenty minutes later, as the darkness deepened, someone appeared at the lighted window, and Divine was quick to focus his device on the person. Alexandra Alex Silkwell had blonde hair piled on top of her head, with a few tendrils slipping down to bookend her elegantly chiseled features. Her eyes were full of intensity, or at least it seemed to him that they were. Divine noted all of these things secondarily. Chiefly, he was riveted by the fact that she wore no clothes. Embarrassed, he lowered his optics but kept his unaided gaze on her, though he couldn't make out the finer details now. Does she know she's being watched? His was the only car out here, and she could obviously see it and its lights. Was she being defiant, giving the curious a show? Or did she not think anyone would be watching the house with the optics Divine was using? Yeah, that might be it, thought a shamed Divine. I'm a peeping Tom with next-gen hardware. He waited until the room went dark once more before driving off. 
As he headed along the whipsawing coast road, he wondered what Alex and Dak thought about the violent end of their older sibling's life. He also wondered whether one of them had killed her, or knew who had. Dak had been in the army, where he had obviously received extensive weapons instruction. Divine would have to find out why the army and Dak Silkwell had parted company. The army didn't give up its recruits easily. They didn't have nearly enough volunteers to fill the ranks, which had caused them to overlook things that in the not-too-distant past would have resulted in outright dismissal. He stopped and sent off a text to Campbell asking for these details. As he drove north to his prearranged meeting with the local cops, Divine thought back to the woman at the window of an ancient house that had long outlived its useful life and was aging with little grace, and yet two young people still resided there. This case might turn out to be even more complicated than he had thought. He checked his watch, hit the gas, and sped up. Time to go look at the body of a woman who should not be dead. Chapter 7 Divine had seen violent death in multiple countries and had caused some of them in his role as a soldier. In certain respects, he had grown desensitized to it, once you'd seen a human being shot up, blown up, or hacked to pieces, what was one more? They all bled and died pretty much the same. He pulled into the parking lot of a funeral home named Bing and Sons. A police cruiser was parked near the front door. Putnam Police Department was emblazoned on the cruiser's side door, along with a picture of an eagle. The majestic bird's claws clenched an arrow shaft, its expression one of fierce determination. The building looked to be originally 1950s construction. It had obviously been remodeled and expanded, Divine noted, with two relatively new wings and what looked to be a crematorium with a long chimney stack housed in a separate building in the rear. He trudged across the asphalt, feeling the biting wind every step of the way as it pushed against him. Before he could tug on the door, it opened, revealing a woman in a police officer's uniform and cap who was standing just inside. No doubt she had been waiting for Divine. She was in her thirties, shortish and thickly built, and to Divine's eye looked like she pumped some serious gym iron. She had on a long-sleeved shirt but no coat or jacket. The brown hair was clipped back. A Smith & Wesson 44 Magnum revolver rested in her holster. He didn't know the police still carried revolvers, but whatever she shot with that bazooka would not be getting back up ever. You Travis Divine with Homeland Security? she said shortly. I am. Let me see your ID, she demanded. He showed her. And you, he said. Sergeant Wendy Fuss, chiefs with Francoise in the body, this way. They began walking down the hall. Francoise? Dr. Francoise Guillaume, she's the medical examiner for this area. Her grandfather and his brother started this funeral home, passed it down to their sons, now her brother, Fred Bing, runs it, but Francoise works here too, in addition to being the local doctor. Busy lady. So did Dr. Guillaume perform the autopsy? She stopped and turned to him. You shitting me? I don't know what you mean. The fact is there was a pissing contest between your folks and ours. They brought someone up from D.C. to do the postmortem over in Augusta at the OCME, the Office of Chief Medical Examiner. Dr. Guillaume assisted because the chief medical examiner for Maine insisted. Jenny was killed here, making it our jurisdiction, not federal. Are the people from D.C. still here? No, they flew in on a government jet, did the postmortem, and flew right back out. Showed me how my tax dollars are being spent. She looked divine up and down in a disgusted manner. And now you're here to do the job we're already doing. I was hoping we could collaborate. Sure you do. Feds are all the same. Think you're better than the locals. Have you had much experience with the federal government? The IRS? That was enough to last me the rest of my days. She picked up her pace and Divine followed. He noticed that she was pigeon-toed and her left shoulder hung a bit lower than her right. Her gun belt squeaked as she walked, as did her rubber-soled shoes over the soft linoleum. That could give away your position and get you killed, but Divine did not think Fuss would be receptive to such federal criticism right now. She reached a door down a short hall, pushed it open, and motioned Divine inside. Fuss put out a blocking hand as he started to cross the threshold. 
You seen a dead body before? She asked in a brusque tone. Don't want you puking on my shoes or passing out. I wouldn't worry about that if I were you, said Divine tightly. Two people were waiting in an interior room off the one they had entered. They were standing next to a metal gurney with a sheet over the body. The room held the potent smells of death and chemicals. Divine was introduced to Chief of Police Richard Wayne Harper, who was quick to tell Divine that he went by Richard, not Rich or Dick. Or Chief will do just fine, he quipped, though the look he gave Divine held no humor. He was in his late forties, paunchy and around 5'10", but he seemed light on his feet and moved with the nimbleness of a far younger man. His hair was thick and the original brown was mixed liberally with gray. He wore no gun, but he did have a metal baton and a holder on his belt. His thick fingers hovered near it at all times. He seemed to exude electrical pulses of confidence with every breath. Francoise Guillaume was also in her 40s, an inch taller than Harper, and athletically lean, with auburn hair pulled back at her nape and secured with a band. Her eyes, active and intelligent, scanned Divine from behind tortoiseshell glasses strung on a synthetic cord. Her white lab coat only partially obscured her dark blue jacket and slacks. She looked no-nonsense and proved it by saying, Ready to get to it, Agent Divine? I thought the autopsy was done in Augusta. It was. We transported Jenny's remains back here so that you could examine them. Okay, let's do it. She lifted the sheet off Silkwell, former CIA ops officer and now a murder victim. Divine ran his gaze down the woman's body. He thought for a moment of the woman's sister standing unclothed at the window. There the similarity ended. Alex Silkwell did not have a large exit wound in the back of her head that had removed a chunk of her brain along with her life. The small, blackened, and crusty entry wound dead center of the forehead didn't seem lethal enough to have killed her. Divine had seen far worse mortal injuries, but looking at the remains of the woman affected him more than he thought it would. He steeled himself to forget about the person and focus on the crime. But it was never easy. Not as a soldier, and not now. Chapter 8 Jenny Silkwell had similar features to her younger sister. A long, slender nose, broad, smooth forehead, classic jawline. He couldn't see the color of her eyes because they were closed. In response to Divine's query, Guillaume said they were light blue, bordering on gray. She said, This was a distant gunshot wound. The abrasion collar was typical, meaning there was no deformity of the bullet before entry into the body. A contact wound would look much different with triangular-shaped tears in the skin and evidence of searing along with soot deposits. And there was no indication of soot, seared skin, or gunpowder tattooing on the body. You'll usually get soot with close-range wounds of half a foot or less. Now, tattooing of the skin with powder grains is pathognomonic of intermediate-range gunshot wounds. It's burned into the skin, so it can't be removed. That's why I ruled out an intermediate-range gunshot. There was no bullet wipe on her clothing since the bullet did not pass through any of that. She looked up at Divine. That's residue from the surface of the bullet itself that ends up on the clothing. I understand she was immersed in salt water. Even if there was bullet wipe, it probably would not have survived, along with any soot. But there wouldn't have been soot with a distant gunshot wound, and water would not have impacted any tattooing. Guillaume pointed to Silkwell's forehead. There you can see what's referred to as the comet tail. It usually shows the direction of the bullet's flight from left to right. The minimal presence of the tail here demonstrates the entry was pretty much straight on. She turned Jenny's head to the side to show the exit wound. People assume the exit wound is always larger than the entry, but it's a fallacy to determine entry and exit wounds based on the sizes of the holes. And abrasion collars, soot, and tattooing are not associated with exit wounds. As you can see, her abrasion collar clearly shows the entry came in the front. The exit wound is gaping, which speaks to the transfer of energy through the frontal bone of the skull, then passing through the soft brain tissue and exiting out the occipital bone. 
skull fragments were propelled through the wound track, which also widened the exit wound. Her death would have been instantaneous. She added in a less professorial tone. She would have been dead before she knew it. Death would have been instantaneous. She would have been dead before she knew it. Divine had heard those phrases many times, and though he knew the physiology behind it, he had never really believed it. He had come close to death several times, and each time it was like the brain sped up as though not to miss a second of its imminent demise. Even for a millisecond or less, I think you know that it's over, that it's the end of you. He said, I suppose the talk screens haven't come back yet? Good Lord, no. And they won't for a while, along with the blood workup. I know how fast they do it on TV. Get a tox and DNA report back by the second commercial break. But the real world moves a lot slower. I guess we don't have the budget Hollywood does. What else can you tell me? Her stomach was empty, and the prelim blood work and examination of her tissue suggested nothing unusual in her system. But the tox screens will be far more definitive. All tox screens in Maine go to a private accredited lab in Pennsylvania for analysis, but I understand these are going to a federal lab for testing, so the turnaround might be faster. We also had two MDIs over from the medical examiner's office to help in the investigation, volunteered Harper. They've gone back to Augusta now. MDI, said Devine. Medical legal death investigator. They're part of the OCME. There are only three in the entire state. But this case was important enough to get two of them here. But all in all, we didn't make much progress, said Harper. He glanced at Devine and his look was not friendly. Guess that's why they sent you in. I think it'll take more than one person to solve this, said Devine diplomatically. Harper said, hell, we have fewer than 30 homicides a year in the whole damn state, and now I got two of them in a short period of time. Two, said Devine. Hit and run, interjected Fuss. Not connected to this. Did you autopsy that one too? Asked Devine, looking at Guillaume. The deputy M.E. did the actual workup, but I assisted. It was a suspicious death, and Chief Harper immediately reported it to the OCME. There was no question a full autopsy would be done under the circumstances. Don't they autopsy all of them? Hardly. Around 15,000 Mainers die every year, the vast majority by accident. We're an outdoorsy, independent people, and that comes with risks. Next highest cause of death is natural, then suicide, underdetermined, and homicide is in last place, thank God. But the autopsy rates are going up. 6% in 2000, 11% the next year, and 15% of total deaths last year received the full workup. What's driving the increase? Drug overdoses. Specifically that fentanyl shit, growled Harper. Guillaume nodded. It's blowing up the OCME's budget. Full autopsy and full tox and blood workups are not cheap. They're building a new OCME facility in Augusta with more capacity, but it'll be a while before it's online. We used to only fully autopsy for those cases necessary for criminal prosecution, or unexpected deaths in people under 55, or where there's a public safety concern like an infectious disease. But now, because of the fentanyl crisis, the decision has been made to fully autopsy all decedents under age 30 if there's any question as to the cause of death. But with, say, a self-inflicted shotgun wound to the head, we're not going to autopsy. Jenny was otherwise in remarkable physical shape, probably would have lived to be 100. Time of death? Asked Divine as he watched Harper and Fuss watch him. Between 9 and 11 p.m. on the night she was found. You're comfortable with that window? The deputy M.E. was, and I concurred. Your M.E. signed off on it, too. It's not just based on forensics, but also the time window from when she was last seen alive and then found dead. I understand a military ammo casing was found at the scene. Harper answered, A federal round. You think one of her own killed her? When Divine looked at him, the man's expression was mocking and Devine had to fight back the urge to voice his displeasure at the comment. Early days yet, 
replied Divine. Can you describe more fully the damage you saw in the wound track? It was substantial. Define substantial. She looked a bit put out by this query. I'm not trying to be a jerk, said Divine. But a 300 Norma Magnum round is a high-velocity ordnance with a heavy load. It'll drop large game with no problem. You doubt the casing we found matches the bullet that hit her, said Harper. Since the actual round was not found, I'm just dotting the I's and crossing the T's. He looked expectantly at Guillaume. I would say that a high-velocity round was indeed used. The kinetic energy was substantial as was the exit wound, where, as I already showed you, there was a large amount of bone and tissue extruded from the wound. The bullet was not a dum-dum because there was no evidence of mushrooming in the wound track. It went pretty much straight through her head and out the rear. Then maybe a full metal jacketed or ball round, as the military often refers to it, said Divine. It's certainly possible. What does that matter? asked Fuss. She looked genuinely curious. Divine said, most NATO military forces only use FMJ or full metal jacketed ammo because of a Hague Convention international treaty signed well over a century ago. They banned the use of expanding bullets even though FMJs have a greater risk of hitting unintended targets. Mushrooms tend to stay in the body. That's why cops all around the world use dum dum ammo because they put the target down with little risk of doing damage to non-targets. Guillaume interjected, but the tumbling effect does catastrophic damage to the target. Divine continued. The U.S. never ratified the treaty, but they've followed it mostly. However, the Army now uses hollow points in some of their ammo chains, sidearms, and the like. The Hague Treaty only applies to wartime, but let's face it, the landscape of war has changed. It's more like urban and rural street fighting rather than big armies going at each other over far-flung, isolated ground. Harper looked at Guillaume. So just to be clear, Jenny was not shot by a dum-dum, but by something that would include this 300 Norma round. Correct. I believe I already said that. Harper looked triumphantly at Divine. Satisfied? For now. Did she see anyone while she was up here, her sister or brother? We don't know, said Harper. Leastways about Alex and Dak. You haven't spoken to them after all this time, said Divine. He might not be an experienced investigator, but he knew the importance of collecting statements from persons of interest as quickly as possible, because memories rapidly faded or became distorted, or stories could be made up, practiced, and falsely corroborated. They're grieving, replied Fuss. We'll talk to him at the appropriate time. It's how we do things up here. Divine glanced at Guillaume, who was staring at him as though awaiting his response to this professional slap. Okay, did you manage to talk to anyone else who wasn't grieving? Divine asked, his ire rising, and uncomfortably so. Dial it back, Travis. You have to work with these folks. A few people saw her around. Nothing more than hello, replied Harper curtly. Where was she staying, Jocelyn Point? No, said Harper. Putnam in, same place as you. Didn't you know that? Fuss looked like she might start laughing. Small town, thought Divine. Everybody knows everybody else's business, even the outsiders. So she spoke to the owner. Sure, she's known Pat for years. Nothing of any note, though, meaning their conversation, just hi, how you doing? Nothing about why she was up here. Did she say whether Silkwell appeared nervous or out of sorts? No, nothing like that. She visited up here pretty much every year, said Fuss. Did you find anything relevant when you searched her room? He asked. Fuss said, we haven't searched it. Before Divine could comment on that, she added, we secured it, taped it off, and waited for you to show up because that's what we were ordered to do from the get-go, by your folks. Harper didn't look happy about this, and Divine could hardly blame him. And now he somewhat understood their unfriendly behavior toward him. So any idea why Silkwell was in town? He was holding back what Claire Silkwell had told him, that Jenny was coming here to settle some unfinished business. No idea yet, but like you said, early days, added Fuss while Guillaume covered the body and then turned away to line up some instruments on a metal table. 
However, Divine could see from the woman's tensed manner that she was intently listening to every word. Tell me about Earl Palmer, the man who found the body. Fuss and Harper exchanged a quick glance that Divine couldn't readily interpret, and Guillaume's shoulders had stiffened and then immediately relaxed when Palmer's name had been mentioned. Harper took a moment to clear his throat while Fuss looked away. Clearly, she was going to let her boss handle this one. Earl's lived here his whole life, retired lobsterman and a damn fine one. His wife Alberta died recently and it rocked him to his core. He's salt of the earth, and his wife was too. Okay, how did he happen to discover the body? She died between 9 and 11 at night, but I understand that he called the police at 1.45 in the morning. What was he doing out at that hour? Hell, lobstermen like dairy farmers don't really sleep, scoffed Fuss with a forced grin tacked on. Even retired ones, she hastily added when she saw Divine was about to interject. Granted, but how did he find the body? I was told it was in an isolated place. Harper said, Earl likes to walk the shoreline. Ever since Bertie, that was what everybody called Alberta, died, he can't sleep. Just drives around or goes out and walks. He likes to hear the ocean. He spent enough of his life on it to where it's in his DNA. Devine slowly nodded and decided he was going to get no farther on this. Did Jenny have a rental car? Yep, offered Fuss. Was it found near the crime scene? Did she drive it there? No, it's back at the Putnam Inn. White two-door Honda, you might have seen it, New York plates. Devine had seen such a car there. So like the room, have you not searched it yet? Those were our instructions, said Harper sharply. Federal instructions. Did anyone see her the night she died? Asked Devine. Dr. Guillaume mentioned a time window. Pat Kingman saw her walk out of the inn around 7.30, said Fuss. She didn't see which way she went. How far from there was she found? 3.2 miles, I clocked it in the car, answered Fuss. Weather that night? Raining like cats and dogs, answered Fuss. Divine shifted his focus to Guillaume. Anything else I should know? Signs of a struggle, defensive wounds, skin of an assailant under her nails, any other forensic evidence at all? No, just the casing. Are you still looking for the round? Fuss said. It was heading toward the ocean after it left Jenny's body. Long gone by now, don't you think? Divine glanced at her and noted the condescending expression. He had seen that look sometimes on superior officers of his, the ones who had been several degrees removed from the actual conditions on the ground, but thought they knew better. He hadn't liked it then, and he didn't like it now. Any luck on tracking down the person she was with? Whoa now, who said she was with anyone? exclaimed Harper. I doubt she walked over three miles in the pouring rain to where she was killed, and she obviously didn't drive herself. A wide-eyed Harper said, Hell, you think she drove over there with someone? Well, it's our job to find that out, right? So let's go to the crime scene. When Divine looked at Guillaume, she was giving him a tiny smile. He returned it. I'll take any support I can get right now, thought Divine. It was like he was back in Afghanistan looking for a friendly face. And I never found many. Let's hope I do better on American soil. Chapter 9 A light drizzle was falling as Divine followed the pair in the muddy cruiser with a bent front ram bar. Divine knew they would learn little at the crime scene in the darkness, but he needed to get a feel for its structures, its parameters, and possibilities. He had been right in telling Campbell that he was not a trained investigator, but the old general had also been correct in informing Divine not to sell himself short in that regard. He had solved the mystery in New York, but he'd had help, and he'd also allowed himself to get shot with his own gun. That still hurt his pride. In the Middle East, he had done countless battlefield assessments, the army documented everything. Battle assessment methodologies, collateral damage assessment, munitions effectiveness, reattack recommendation methodologies, post-campaign operations actions. In this regard, they were looking for the smallest clues and telltale signs as to why a combat operation had not gone according to plan, or why damage was above expectations, or how an IED had been able to get close enough to kill its intended target. 
so his mind was trained to see certain things. Sometimes things went sideways just due to shitty luck, Divine knew. When many people were gathered in close quarters trying their best to kill one another, there wasn't a report or methodology in the world that could cover all the possible contingencies or outcomes. Humans under threat of death were just too unpredictable. Some turned into cowards, and others into heroes, and still others into both. Divine had on numerous occasions successfully interrogated people he thought were allies and those he knew to be enemies, and found out vital information in most of those cases. He had not done it with brute force, though on occasion he had wanted to, as he stared into smug expressions projecting unearned superiority. They were the hardened countenances of people who would do absolutely nothing to help you and absolutely anything to do the opposite to you. He hoped whatever talent he possessed for this sort of work was enough for this case. Campbell seemed to have faith in him, justified or not. He looked over, and there stood Jocelyn Point like a lighthouse on the coast, only with very little light to offer. Offshore, a collection of blackened clouds was gathering, and perhaps pondering whether to come onto land and pummel the puny scattering of humans who dwelled there. A few minutes later, the cruiser pulled off to the side of the road, rubber gripping mud, and stopped. Divine slipped his Tahoe in behind and got out. So she died not that far from her old homestead. The wind seemed fiercer at this point. He didn't know if it was due to the approaching storm or some weird topographical feature at this spot. But as he walked up to join the two officers of the law, Divine thought this was a perfectly macabre backdrop for violent death. It was essentially Edgar Allan Poe-esque in its deep sense of potentially sinister intrigue. He stood there for a few moments and gave a sweeping gaze across the landscape, taking in all points that seemed to him of interest. Fuss held one powerful light, and she produced another from the cruiser and handed it to Divine. He used it to illuminate a stand of scrub pines off to the left. There was also an open field of grass and wild plants that seemed to thrive even in the stark chill. Another stand of deciduous trees was off to the far right, their trunks and naked branches registering as shadows in the dark. Thick, burly bushes were everywhere, with many of them also bereft of leaves. Divine had been to Maine before on training exercises with the rangers. He knew it held the highest percentage of wooded land of any state, at nearly 90%, and he had become something of an amateur horticulturist, so as to determine the types of trees and bushes for suitable concealment while being shot at, or attempting to sneak up on an enemy, as well as what one could safely eat when one's own food ran out, and which bark and herbs and flowers were viable for treating wounds when there was no more medicine at hand. Thus he knew the main state tree was the eastern white pine, several of which he could see here now. The state flower was the white pine cone. He eyed his two companions, who were staring resolutely at him. Time to turn from botany to homicide. Where was she found? He asked. They led him along a broad, rutted path through the trees, and kept going until they reached the end of land. More than a dozen feet below, there was nothing except a shelf of blackened and eroded rocks and boulders that acted as a natural seawall against the pounding surf. It was close to high tide now, and hard spray from the incoming water meeting this immovable boundary of stone nearly reached them where they stood. Fuss shone her light on one spot and held it. Right about there, she said. The body had fallen from here to there after Jenny was shot, explained Harper. Divine looked at where they were all standing and then down at the rocks. You're sure that's what happened? She was shot and then fell down there. Pretty damn sure, yeah? I mean, what else? Said Harper. How was the body facing? Harper looked at Fuss, who said, Best as I can remember, head to land and feet out to the ocean. She could have flipped over on her way down since she was shot from the front. Best as you can remember? Didn't somebody take pictures? Didn't the feds go over it before the body was moved? Fuss barked, Hell, we couldn't leave her there. Tide was coming in and there was a storm. She would have been washed out to sea if we waited another minute. But you have pictures before she was moved. Look, Divine, you weren't here, okay? Said Fuss. The water was all over Jenny when we got here. You heard Doc Guillaume. Time of death was between 9 and 11. We didn't get here until after 2 in the morning. 
We had to move fast, real fast, and we're not CSI. We got one ambulance and two volunteer EMTs in Putnam. I called in everybody I could, including some men I knew from the county with climbing experience to go down there and help bring her up. Before they got here, we put a rope around Jenny to keep her from getting swept out. We all got soaked to the skin, and the water was so cold it damn well burned. We had to use a truck with a winch to bring her up, but we did our best to make sure we did as little damage to the body as possible. We didn't have hours or days to plan this out. We had minutes. She ended with a bark, her posture all defensive and annoyed. Okay, okay, said Divine. I get it. Where was the casing found? They led him back to a spot that lined up with where Jenny had been shot and gone over the edge. Divine gauged it to be a little over 300 or so yards from where Jenny had purportedly been shot. There was a cleft in the tree line here with an unobstructed sight line to the edge of the bluff. On his voicing this opinion on the distance, Fuss told him, It's 321 yards, I measured it myself. Divine worked the sight line and trajectory in his head. While officers could not become snipers in the army, Divine had supervised several teams of snipers and spotters. He was intimately familiar with the weapons and ammo used, the physiological processes involved, and the ballistic calculations that went into ending the life of another human being over substantial distances using a long-barreled rifle and scope. And he came away with the conclusion that things were not making sense. You're sure this is the spot? He asked. Fuss said angrily, I marked it myself. We did have the time to work the scene up here. That was where the casing was found, and I'll swear to that in court. Divine knew they were upset that the feds were looking over their shoulders and controlling the investigation and the processing of the evidence. But was there something else behind Fuss's look of vitriol? Any evidence of robbery? None. She had two rings and a necklace and a fancy watch, a brightling, said Fuss, her tone less aggressive now. We got it all back in the evidence room along with her other things. Purse, wallet. I imagine they're back in her room. If you give the okay, we can search it finally, said Harper. Tomorrow morning work for you, said Divine. Nine o'clock, I'll bring the coffee. Saw a place close to the inn, main brew. How's that sound? Sure, that works, said Harper in a friendlier tone, acknowledging this olive branch offered by Divine. We both take it black. I suppose with the weather there were no footprints, tire tracks. We looked, said Fuss. But it was a quagmire by then. Truck we used to winch her up got stuck, had to get a tow truck to pull it out. We weren't getting any trace from that mess. Divine looked back at the cliff where Jenny had allegedly gone over. So how did Palmer find her body? He would have had to go right up to the edge and then look down. Harper said, Earl told me he was out walking late that night. He couldn't sleep. Out walking in the pouring rain? Fuss interjected. Earl Palmer had nothing to do with what happened to Jenny. Divine kept his gaze on Harper. Never said he did. I'm just trying to understand the situation. I have superiors I have to report to, and they'll be asking me very pointed questions, like I'm asking you. Harper and Fuss exchanged a glance, a worried one. Harper said, he was a lobsterman. Foul weather means nothing to him. And I told you he lost his wife. He probably didn't even know what he was doing, just wandering aimlessly. Did he walk from his house or drive? He walked, and he happened to come over to this spot and just stared out at the ocean, a place he spent most of his life. And then he looked down and saw her and called 911. So it was just a coincidence that he picked this spot out of all the others around here to go and take a look at the water and happened to glance down and find a body. Each word that came out of Divine's mouth sounded more unbelievable to him than the previous one. Coincidences like that do happen, Divine, said Fuss. Maybe in novels, thought Divine, but not ever in real life. They parted company with the agreement to meet up at the inn the following morning. As Divine drove back into town, he stopped and quickly pulled over to the curb. Dax Silkwell, whom he recognized from the photo in his briefing book, had just walked into a bar called The Hops. Chapter 10 Divine had been in countless watering holes in many countries during his military career. They pretty much all looked and functioned the same. 
although there had been one in South Korea that had been a little out there. Over their torsos, the waitresses had worn crisscrossed ammo belts with orange-flavored tequila shots instead of bullets in the cartridge pouches. And that was pretty much all they had on. The hops was far more formulaic in its offerings. A scattering of tables and chairs, a small scuffed parquet dance floor, a tiny raised stage for live music, empty now, and a long bar with wooden stools, a big mirror, rows of terraced liquor bottles, and six beers on tap. A Janis Joplin song was playing on an old-fashioned jukebox, and the late singer's one-of-a-kind voice resonated over them like thunder across a flowered meadow. Although the singer had died over two decades before he was born, one of Divine's father's friends had introduced him to rock and roll performers from that era. Joplin had quickly become one of his favorite vocalists. He had often listened to her songs during combat deployments overseas, much to the amusement of his fellow soldiers, who were far more into musicians from their own generation. Oh Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? The bar was mostly full, and Divine could imagine it was probably the only such establishment in town. Set off in a small wing of the building were two pool tables, where men and women were smacking the balls around and performing the flirty, maybe something later ritual that such social environments inspired. A well-used Terminator pinball machine was being played by a blonde woman in her mid-thirties, dressed in tight jeans and a loose black blouse that enticingly displayed her ample cleavage. Nearby, two young men in their early twenties were enjoying a furious match of foosball, all the while eyeballing the blonde with equal parts lust and youthful hope. Dax Silkwell was easy to spot, with his height and heft. Divine knew all the man's vitals from viewing his army file. He was 6'4 and looked to be carrying about 230 pounds. He had on jeans, muddy boots, and a leather jacket. Divine watched as he shed the jacket and hung it on a wall peg. Underneath, he had on a white muscle shirt that showed off his impressive biceps and delts, as well as a sculpted back, his lats and rhomboid muscles heavily chiseled. Both arms were fully tatted, as were the tops of his pecs. The image of an emerald green snake wrapped around his thick, veined neck. Dak claimed a stool and lifted a finger at one of the women working behind the bar. The young woman poured out a yingling from one of the taps and carried it over to him. Dak waved and nodded to several people who performed the same gesture back. A regular, thought Divine. An old man next to Dak paid his bill, hopped off his stool, threw on his coat, and was gone, his thirst evidently satiated. Divine sat down on the vacated stool and motioned to the other woman working the bar. She was in her forties, with sandy hair and a wiry physique. In the mirror, he could see the edge of her smartphone sticking out of one rear pocket and the top of a purple vape out of the other. Yingling on draft, he said. She nodded, poured, and delivered it. Five bucks. Divine slipped her a ten and told her to keep it. Dax sipped his beer, staring straight ahead, but Divine knew this game and had glanced twice in the mirror to see Dax's pupils swivel in his direction. In fact, everyone in the place pretty much had shot looks at the outsider in their midst. Before Divine had sat down, he had seen in the mirror's reflection that Dax had said something to the old man right before he so readily jumped up, leaving the stool empty. If Divine's lip reading was right, it was something like, Beat it, Joe. Somebody wants your seat. Divine sipped his beer and contemplated his next move. Tactics and strategies rolled through his head like they had during combat on unforgiving terrain with a wily opponent who was doing the same thing. He finally said, I'm sure you know who I am, probably when Patricia Kingman started making the phone rounds about the stranger in town. And then maybe a heads up from the local constabulary? Dak didn't turn his head, but both men were now eyeing each other in the mirror. Divine watched as the other man's muscles tensed. Divine's muscles did nothing. There was no reason to. Yet. And the other man's respiration had noticeably elevated while Divine's had actually slowed. Dak Silkwell had obviously forgotten some or all of what the army had painstakingly taught him, or maybe he'd never taken it seriously in the first place. Perhaps that was why they had parted company. His phone buzzed. He eased it from his pocket and read the text that Campbell had just sent. PFC Dax Silkwell, OTH. That was army speak for other than honorable, 
This meant that Dak had done something bad, but not egregious enough for a punitive consequence such as a court-martial and prison confinement under the Uniform Code of Military Justice. That also meant Dak couldn't rejoin the Army and had forfeited most, if not all, of his military benefits. Campbell had not indicated the reason for the OTH, but Devine knew most of them by heart. Violence against military personnel or a civilian, adultery, drug or alcohol abuse, and a security violation. Anything more serious in the OTH would not have been possible. So which one are you, Dak? The man finally stirred, but only to order another beer. When it came, Dak broke the silence. Travis Devine. Homeland Security. And I know why you're here. Devine said, I'm sorry for your loss. Dak turned to him, perhaps to gauge Devine's level of sincerity without the mirrored buffer. Jenny didn't deserve to go out that way. She was a good person. She have enemies that you know of? You'd know better than me, considering what she did for a living. That would require a stranger in town. Anyone see anything like that? Dak shook his head, clearly thinking this through. I haven't. You'd have to ask around. Everyone picked up on me really fast. Just thought it would have worked through the grapevine if another outsider had passed through. Dak shrugged. Don't know what to tell you. Literally, or is something else getting played out here? You see your sister or talk to her while she was here? Dak took longer than necessary to answer this simple question. I didn't even know she was in town. It was a shock when we found out she was dead. We as in you and your sister? Asked Devine. Dak nodded and sipped his beer. Did Jenny see or talk to your sister while she was here? Not that she mentioned. You'd have to ask her. I plan to. You know Earl Palmer? Sure. A good man. He found Jenny's body. I understand he just recently lost his wife. Likes to wander at night. Lucky for us. Otherwise, Jenny might have gotten washed out to sea. When can I have a more formal interview with you? And your sister, of course. Doesn't this count as my formal interview? Afraid not. I work six days a week, ten to eight. My tattoo shop's around the corner. Inkwell. Get it? Yeah, clever. Small town keep you that busy? I've built a rep. Lots of folks from Jonesport, Micaias, and Cutler. And I have clients from all over New England. Even Canada. Nice, replied Devine. He ran his gaze over Devine. You got tats? You look the sort. None voluntarily. But I've got a real wicked one around my ankle and calf. Picked it up in the Middle East on the biting end of an IED. Dax shot him a funny look. Army or Marine? The former. You couldn't have pulled the full ride. You're way too young. Decided to do something else with my life. Dak drained his beer. Yeah, me too. A pulse throbbed in the man's temple. He knows that I know about the OTH. We can grab some breakfast or late dinner, your call, and my treat. I'm not usually an early riser. Dinner, then. I only do organic. They got a place here for that? Asked Devine doubtfully. Yeah, it's a place called Only Real Food. I'm an investor. They get customers from all over Maine. Aroostook, Piscataquis, Waldo, Kennebec, York. Canada, too. Just like my tat shop. It's no coincidence. I push all my investments with my clients. Congrats. So, nine o'clock tomorrow night? I guess. I'd like a more definitive reply. Okay. Nine it is. The restaurant is two blocks south of here. Take a left on Hiram Silkwell Street. Seriously? Named after the man who was born and grew up here and made all that money. Less than 300 people now. What happened? It's always been a toy town. But outside the town line is our version of the Burbs where we have nearly 4,000 people. And your sister, where can I see her? She's usually home. I need her phone number. 
I'd like to set something up. Dak gave it to him, but added, She doesn't usually answer, particularly if she doesn't know who's calling. He handed Dak a card. Here's my number, then you can tell her to answer when I call. Alex doesn't follow orders, and usually not advice either. I'm persistent. I understand she's quite an artist. Says who? So she's not a good artist? No, she's good. Better than good, actually. But her taste is, uh, eclectic. And she only parts with a piece when she really needs the money. Big house. You'd think she'd really need the money a lot. I do well at the tattoo parlor. And I make good money off my investments. Okay, I'm not in Hiram Silkwell's league, but give me time. I saw your father, Divine told him. Now came the first hint of strong emotion on Dak's expressive face. He's not doing well. You're in the loop on all that? Dak nodded. I've been down to see him. Go as often as I can. He say anything to you? He wasn't really awake. They say he doesn't have long. A warrior deserves a better exit, said Divine. Dak tapped his surprisingly delicate fingers against his empty beer mug. They also looked to have been manicured. Divine looked down at his own ragged ones and frowned. Yeah, you'd think so, wouldn't you? You disagree? His military days were pretty much over when I came along. But then he got into politics. He wasn't around much. Divine decided to go there. But you suited up, wore the army green. Dak eyed him. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. He dropped some cash for the beers and rose. I'm beat. Gotta get going. You need a lift? Nah, got my Harley. Love that thing. Divine watched him every step of the way. He was seriously thinking of following him home when he spotted three large men, pool sticks in hand, staring dead at him. When Divine left, so did they. The sounds of what might have been Dax Harley soared off into the night, leaving him alone with his three new main besties. Wonderful way to end a long, unproductive day. Chapter 11 The body will not go where the mind has not been. That was why most people were victims, Divine knew. They could not imagine themselves grievously injuring or killing someone else for any reason, even in order to save their own lives. So they wasted time in attempting to flee or in pleading for mercy to men who had none to give. Show a picture of someone attacking someone else and ask for a reaction, and 99% of the people will say they would be in fear of their life if that happened to them. The other 1%, the criminal element, have a different reaction. They will say, I'd hit them harder. This was because they never saw themselves as the victim, only the predator. Their minds have been there, and so their bodies were ready, willing, and able to go there, too. Yet all humans were built to be predators. Sharp, strong teeth, forward eyes that were far more efficient for hunting, opposable thumbs, and most of all, the best brain of any animal. And we all possess a latent, primal ability to fight to the death. Divine walked toward his Tahoe even as he heard the men follow. When he reached it, he turned and faced them. They looked angry and puffed up. That was all he needed to know, both of their intent and their being afraid of him. The ones Divine always worried about were not the giant red-faced screamers. They were secretly shitting their pants. It was the quiet, stone-faced, scrawny guys that would suddenly gut you with a shiv or pop a bullet into your brain and walk, not run, away disappearing into the night to do it again when someone else was stupid enough to underestimate them. His senses did the preliminary calculation and ran it through the combat computer under his skull. Walking away from a fight, if you could do so safely, was usually the best answer. Looking at the three men, Divine knew that was not going to be an option, unless he did something creative, and he didn't want to fight them. Not because he knew he would lose, it was because he was certain he would win and didn't want to unnecessarily injure them. And he was also wondering why they had decided to come after him in the first place. Can I help you? He said. The biggest one said, Yeah, dude, 
You can get out of town. That'll be a good start. He looked at his friends and grinned. Sorry, I have a job to do and it can't be done remotely. Then we got us a problem, or more to the point, you do, said the same man. Divine glanced up and down the street. Not another living soul. Other than the bar, the storefronts were dark. The roar of the incoming tide along the harbor was really the only sound, other than the men's collective breathing. They were all big and strong and pumped full of alcohol and who knew what else. Two of them were in short sleeves despite the chilly weather. He looked at the drug tracks on their beefy arms and came up with a plan. He pointed at the man who had spoken. I know you, don't I? The man in his late forties and taller than Divine by about three inches and outweighing him by thirty pounds looked taken aback. I don't know you, he snarled. You need to think again said Divine. He opened his jacket to show his Glock. The men saw it, and the dynamic instantly changed. He took out his cred pack with the badge and held it up for all to see. Homeland Security. But you already knew that. You talked to us about a domestic terrorist network operating up here and selling drugs to fund their operations. I never forget a face. We did the briefing over in Bangor so nobody would know. The man looked apoplectic. I never talked to no fucking feds. Divine watched as the other two men glanced suspiciously at their comrade. What's your name? Asked Divine. I don't need to tell you a damn thing. That's okay, it'll be in our files. But from what I remember, you were a big help. So thanks. We nailed some local badasses because of you. The man suddenly realized his friends were staring at him, and not in a good way. He's lying, I didn't do any of that shit. You know that, you know me. Divine was not going to give up precious ground. Well, that's why we recruit people like you. You're on the inside and you know everybody's business. You're lying, the man roared. Divine touched the butt of his gun just as a reminder that it was there and had the means to kill all three of them with hardly any effort on his part. Now again, what can I do for you? No, scrap that, I don't have the time. Any of you see Jenny Silkwell before she died? The men looked at one another, ostensibly flummoxed by another abrupt change in the direction of the conversation. We don't know nothing about that, said the second man, shorter than his friend but thicker. The drug tracks on his left arm looked like the measles, swollen, nasty, and painful. I'm not accusing you of having anything to do with her death, but I need to find out why she was here and who she might have met and spoken with. Did you know her? The men seemed reluctant to say one way or another until the third fellow spoke up. He was younger than the other two, late thirties at most. I went to high school with her. I played football and she ran track and did gymnastics. And she was smart, too. Graduated top in the class. She was the, what do you call it? Valedictorian. Yeah. So what was your take on her? Asked Divine. She... Everybody loved Ginny, me included. He glanced at his companions, clearly embarrassed at this frank admission. Did you see her when she was last up here? He nodded. Saw her on the street. I waved to her and she waved back. Call me by my name, though I've changed some. Gotten fat and lost most of my hair, but she remembered me. This was obviously a point of pride with the man. Did she seem okay? Yeah, I mean, I think so. She comes up here from time to time, but that was the first I'd seen her in a few years. She comes to visit her brother and sister. He wiped his nose. I guess so. I don't really know. I'm not really tight with the family. Divine eyed the tats on the other two men. You guys know Alex or Dak? Looks like you both got inked by him. The smaller of them said, Yeah, dude's an artist. And fair with his prices. He ever talk about Jenny? The one looked at the other. No, not really, said the man Divine had accused of being an informant. He scowled and added, Here she was a fed. You know her sister? She's an artist too. Alex is different, said the same man. Goes to the beat of her own drummer, said the other. Gorgeous gal, but... Hell, don't know why she's still here. She could go out to L.A. or somewhere and make a hell of a lot of money. 
or marry some rich dude and fly around in a private jet, said the man Divine had accused. Not all live in some spooky old house in the middle of fucking nowhere. So why do you think she never did that? asked Divine. The man shrugged. Like I said, she's different. I don't think she cares about money and shit like that. When was the last time you saw her? Maybe six months ago when she rode her bike into town. Motorbike? No, pedal bike. You speak to her? No, she don't like to interact with folks. Keeps to herself. Don't mess with nobody. Okay. What do you know about Earl Palmer? He found the body. They all looked at one another. Again, the man he'd accused of being an informant answered. Good man. Old school, but he's hurting bad. Just lost his wife. Then to find Jenny. <sighs> Shit, man, talk about bad luck. Where exactly does he live? I'll just need to get his statement. The man told him and added, Little cottage way off the road, white with green shutters, can't miss it. Only place around there. I understand he was a lobsterman. One of the best, said the same man. And I should know I'm one too. Damn hard work for not much money. And the lobsters, they're going AWOL. Say it's climate change, warming water, and they're heading north. All I know is my money got cut in half. Had to get a second job. Most days I come off the boat all tired as hell and go right to work at another gig. Then you needed that beer in the hop, observed Divine. The man grinned. Damn sure did. Divine looked at the other men. And just so you know, I made up the stuff about him working with the feds. Why the hell did you do that? Barked the man he'd accused. Because I could sense you three might want to do me physical harm, and I didn't want to pull my gun on you and start shooting, so I used that to defuse the situation. What do you think? Did I make the right call? Yeah, you did. The man now looked sheepish. We're pretty much just being drunk and stupid. Divine said, Any particular reason why you decided to have a beef with me, other than the drunk and stupid part? The men looked at one another again. The first man said, Nope, that's about it. Uh-huh, said Divine, who didn't believe this. Well, I appreciate the help. If you think of anything else... He handed each of them his card with his cell phone number. Then the man who had gone to school with Jenny said, I can't think of no reason why somebody would want to hurt her. Well, it's my job to find out, and I'm pretty good at my job. I hope.